Hi everybody, my name's Bill and this is my dog Wilson. Today we're going to be talking about the NES, the Nintendo Entertainment System. This is my one here from 1987. It just goes to show that retro video game systems can hold up today. It's this little grey box which helped save the US from a video game crash in 1983. So, as a way of saying thanks, me and Wilson have put together a top 10 list based around what games we believe as being classics. We hope you enjoy. Duck Hunt. This is Duck Hunt, and it's one of the first games I played on the NES. It was all pretty amazing for its time. It used an accessory called the NES Zapper. This used light detection to find out where the targets were, and it worked really well. I don't know many people know this, but you can actually use a controller to move the ducks. It's pretty boring to do this, but it gave my younger brother something to do. Thinking about it now, I must have been completely desensitised as a kid. Seeing that dog holding the two dead ducks was pretty disturbing. For those of you who are less sadistic in nature, there's a clay pigeon shooting game. It's the same sort of deal, just a different layout, and you have to adjust your aim in order to hit the pigeons. Nonetheless, Duck Hunt was a classic game, and it's definitely worthy of number 10. Super Mario Brothers. When I said Duck Hunt was one of the first games I ever played, this was the first game I ever played, and what an experience it was. Me and my family were all gathered around an old TV with an NES instruction manual, trying to get the thing to work. 45 minutes to an hour later we played the first level of Mario 1, running directly into the first gimbal we saw, but you can't tell me you didn't do the same. It really didn't take long for Super Mario Bros. to be a success, not only in my home, but many others all around the world. Who remembers the Super Mario Bros. cartoon? They used to air that on breakfast TV before I used to go to school. What fond memories they were. There's not a lot left I can say about Super Mario Bros. Today it could be one of the most recognised and iconic games to date. But one thing I must mention was the element of mystery and anticipation it gave me when I completed each world. The premise was simple, complete three levels and a castle. At the end of each castle, Toad would tell the princess is somewhere else and it'd flip you off. The manual did a good job of building up the hype too. It would show you all the different enemies you would face in the game, but it would never show you what the princess looked like. This gave me a huge incentive to progress. I'm sure most of you must complete Mario Bros by now, and if you haven't, here she is. And isn't she worth it? Well, she was back then. Monster in my pocket. It's a monster you could put in your pocket. Get it? No? Well, let me explain. Monster in my pocket was a craze in the 90s. You could get these things in many different ways, from finding one in your breakfast cereal, or popping down to your local news agents and getting on there. These little figures were based around all the horror movies your parents tried to avoid you seeing. They also released trading cards to go over your monster. On these, you could learn about its history, and there was also a point system that would indicate how powerful it was. Monster in my pocket had a seventh season, but by then it was exhausted, and unfortunately it lost its charm. But lucky for us, a Nintendo game was released by Konami, and it was a lot of fun. You could play either as a vampire or Frankenstein's monster. The story is pretty simple, even by NES standards. While you're watching TV, Warlock appears and says he's sent out his henchmen. With no questions asked, you get to it. Looking back, the game was a simple platformer, but it did contain some of the characters from the first series. It was cool to see these toys come alive for the first time on screen. The boss fights are pretty cool too. It is always interesting to find out what you'll be up against next. Remember what I said about the trading cards? Well there's the Great Beast. He's one of the most powerful monsters in the entire series. So you better get running buddy. I felt the backgrounds are pretty cool too. It was in the same vein as Micro Machines, making the character feel small in a big world. If you've never heard of Monster in My Pocket, then today it's going to play like any other platformer. But if you have heard of it, then you're in for a treat. Solar Jetman Solar Jetman was one of those games that you would randomly pick up not knowing much about, and it just so happened to be one of the best games on the system. You had the ability to free roam and explore, and it was something completely new to me. The idea of the game was pretty simple. You had to travel from planet to planet, finding pieces of the Golden Warp ship, and getting enough fuel to travel to the next location. Another cool aspect about this game was earning and spending points for power-ups and upgrades. One thing that was great about this game was the way it controlled. 
You could move in any direction, but getting used to this was quite difficult. But as soon as you mastered it, you could drift around caverns, taking out enemies and picking up items. Picking up objects was always a bit of a struggle. The weight of the item would often slam you into the rocks, so you'd have to calculate the right amount of speed in order to pick it up. This game was praised on its release, but was criticised as being too hard. If you like a challenge, give it a go. Shadowgate Who remembers Nightmare? It ran every Friday and I remember having to run home from school to catch it. It was an adventure-based TV show with a medieval edge. Children would take part in a group of four and one of which would don the Helmet of Justice. It would render him blind, making his teammates his only eyes for the whole journey. It was about 25 minutes an episode. Providing everything went well for the team, they'd be back the following Friday to pick up where they left off. Me and my wife went to see Nightmare Live on stage, and it was amazing! You should definitely go and see it. Anyway, this is Shadowgate. You might be surprised to see this here, as in all honesty, it got terrible reviews when I was growing up. Yes, the puzzles are cryptic, yes, it could be unfair sometimes, but I loved it. It was one of those games that had a creepy atmosphere. Going on an adventure, gaining items, and eventually solving those cryptic puzzles all really appealed to me. It may not seem like it, but it's one of those games you'll play late at night, in the dark, on your own. Okay, there's something I've got to tell you about Nightmare. You can die in it. That's right, a kid's show you can die in. We all thought this was awesome, and the same rules apply in Shadowgate. And it didn't shy away from a painless death either. You could get torn apart by a shark and watch the lake slowly turn red with your blood. I would definitely say give this game a chance. Plenty of classics back in the day got poor reviews upon their release, and I say this is one of them. Castlevania. Yeah, I don't have it. This is Castlevania, a game inspired by all the Hammer Horror and B-movies. Unfortunately, I never got to play this in my youth. This is a solid platform from Konami. It features a ton of different enemies and bosses. In total, the game has 18 stages, and it's well known for being difficult, but without being too frustrating. You play as Simon Belmont, a vampire killer, and you controlled really well. You can crouch, jump, and attack with a whip. It all felt pretty solid. It followed a map system, and it was exciting to see how far away you were from Dracula. Aside from the whip, you can find various weapons to help you out, such as the cross or holy water. These are essential if you want to beat some of the bosses. As I said, I'm fairly new to this game, and I can't believe how good it must have been back in the day. It's highly regarded as being one of the best games on the NES. And for this game to have such a strong impact on me as an adult, I can definitely believe that. One famous and strange aspect about the game was the fake names part giving a nod to all the classic horror actors. Surely the actual team that worked on this game deserve a mention, don't they? Anyway, it's a great game, check it out. Zelda 2 The Adventure of Link Okay, I know most of you must be pissed at this one. Yes, I prefer Zelda 2 to the first one. Reason being is, I never owned or played the first game. But maybe we can agree that the cartoon had the worst catchphrase ever. One of the things I liked most about this game was the combat. I would enjoy fighting the knights. At first I'd die every time, but as soon as I got good at blocking along with timing, you'd get in some really intense battles. The enemies are pretty weird, like blobs on the floor and bulldogs with spears. And could that be Wilson's mutated half-brother? Oh my god, he's throwing boomerangs as well. In Zelda 2 you can get experience points from killing enemies. This helps in levelling up. You can also gather items and obtain magic from various dungeons. And if you're stuck, you can always get help from the townspeople. This magic word will give you power. Well, what sort of power are we talking about? So at the end, you find the Triforce with the help of the Caucasian Yoda. Zelda finally wakes from her sleep. And you save Hyrule and are a real hero. This game is considered the oddball out of the Zelda series. But I say thanks a million. DuckTales 2 
Duck Tales started off as a Saturday morning TV show, and looking back, it's a classic cartoon from the 90s. Though, if you own a vault full of money, never try this. Ah, it's not a liquid! DuckTales 1 and 2 are pretty much the same game. They both use the same sprite design, and Scrooge McDuck in the sequel has no new abilities, but he gets to keep the pogo stick, and that's all that matters. Yeah, that's right, the pogo stick. I don't believe there was any mention of this in the cartoon. And it's pretty strange for an elderly duck to be jumping around the place. But this is Nintendo, and anything can happen. Much like the first game, you have five areas to explore, which makes it pretty easy to complete. I didn't have a problem with this, though. I had a friend that lived about two hours away from me, and he owned both copies. We would happily spend the weekend playing them, and we'd get enough time to complete them before we went home. Seeing as these games are so similar, I'm going to say I prefer the second one over the first. Not because it's better, but it's so much harder to find than the first one. My wife bought me the Famicom version for my birthday. I'm so happy to have it again. I thought I'd never be able to play an original cartridge, as prices are going crazy and getting higher and higher. Just for the record, I think these games are made to be played, and not stored in a vault somewhere hoping they're raising money someday. Let me show you the coolest thing about DuckTales 2. The end bad guy is the D2000. Yeah, heavily inspired by the T2000 from Terminator 2. Despite how rare it's become, it's one of my favourites, and DuckTales 1 or 2 is my number 3 on this list. Kabuki Quantum Fighter Who would find their games at car boot sales at the weekend? That's where I found Kabuki Quantum Fighter. It had no box, no instructions, I was just judging it by the cover. I mean, who would say no to a guy jumping over a dog from Ghostbusters wearing flares and a dodgy wig? So, my first impression of this game was, wow, a man using his hair as a weapon. The boss fights were really cool. Here I am fighting a mummy. And each time you kill a boss, you acquire a new weapon. To anyone watching, this probably looks like any other generic platformer, but the amount of time I had playing this captured many happy memories. Oh, I just want to say, these things look like duck heads. My favourite enemy in the game was this guy. He reminded me of the Xenomorph. The enemies are from your nightmares. I mean, what's that? Who are you? What are they? Who's he? Oh my god. I'm making out like I don't like this game, but I absolutely love it. After I'd finished playing, I would often draw pictures that would be heavily inspired by what I'd seen. I guess it helped me think outside the box, and actually made me use my imagination more. It's a really common title to get, and it won't cost you much on eBay. It's just a shame we didn't see him again for another adventure. It's showtime! Super Mario Bros. 3. Wow, this is Mario Bros. 3, and not only is it the best game on this list, it's the best game I've ever played. Of course, there was an animated TV show which was good, and there was a film feature in the game which was okay. And let's not forget the Happy Meal toys were probably the same amount of plastic content as in the food. 
For anyone too young to remember, I'll try and describe how good this game was upon its release, using a more contemporary series of games as an example. Look at the first GTA, it's a classic. Back then there was nothing else like it, it was simple but effective. Now imagine GTA 5 being released straight after. Seriously, Mario 3 is that good. At least it was for me. I know I'm sorry, I haven't mentioned Mario 2. It's a great game, but I never played it as a kid, and for that reason it made the transition from Mario 1 to the third instalment that much stronger. And now for the story. Bowser has had seven kids. They have stolen the seven wands from the seven kings, and transformed them into animals. Your job is to defeat the kids and Bowser, return the wands, change the kings back, and restore peace to the Mushroom Kingdom. Yeah, it's a big game, and it's no surprise that Nintendo Power released a strategy guide. Let's talk about the Super Leaf. This was a power-up that would change Mario into a raccoon. Yeah, a flying raccoon at that. It was the first time we'd seen Mario fly, but this was just the beginning. Mario could acquire a range of different suits that would help him throughout levels. There was the frog suit if you want to be a stronger swimmer. There was the tanuki suit which would change you into a statue that would make you invulnerable for a short period of time. And last, but definitely not least, is my favourite, and that's the Hammer Brother suit, where you can actually play as one of the most fearsome enemies from the first game. A lot of people's favourite is the Goomba shoe. It only makes one appearance in the game, but it's a lot of fun to use. There are many different ways of acquiring items in Mario 3, one of which is visiting toad houses and getting them there. Another method is a card flipping mini game. If you match any cards, you get the item. But miss twice and you're out. There was also another game in which you could acquire up to five extra lives. Just don't mess up like I always did. Mario 3 would follow eight different maps, and each one was unique. You could be chilling out in Iceland, or heating things up in Desertland, or end up completely submerged in Waterland. Maybe even having a showdown with Bowser and saving the princess in Darkland. When I was young, I'd go for walks in the park. I was so hyped on this game, the outside world started to become the Mario universe. I even found some old sketches that I did in the attic. I was really obsessed. But I somehow don't think I was alone. In this day and age, people often debate whether video games are art or not. But in all honesty, I think the signs have been there for many, many years. Thanks for watching. It's taken a while to finish this. As you can see, I've grown a beard since we started. Now that's dedication for you. Remember, I judge these games on how they played for me as a kid, and the memories I have with them. So I suppose your list will be different than mine. After all, we can't always be the same, can we? How boring that would be. Please feel free to like and subscribe, and we'll see you soon.